looks like our room is filling up. Um, we just hit noon. Um, I'll give everyone a second to sort of filter in, but um, good afternoon. And um, to all my East Coast colleagues, thanks for spending your lunch break with us uh, today. Um, friends in Mountain or Pacific time, hope you're enjoying kind of the last bits of your cold brew as you engage with the content we've got prepared. Um, we've had quite a lot of interest from research administrators and research compliance specialists, uh, information security officers, export control officers, and other business functions. And we've got quite a few leaders from institutions all over the country on today's session. Um, we're really excited that there was such a, a, a thirst for information. Um, and we really encourage you throughout today um, the session to submit your questions that you might have on Zoom. And given sort of the volume um, and the amount of registrants, we might circle back with a follow-up session where we answer those questions in a targeted and anonymized way. Um, we'll also be recording today's session um, and it'll be available for playback um, in a few days. If we advance to the next slide, I'll take us through the agenda. So thanks again uh, for registering and attending. Um, we're really excited at Huron to be partnering with Choate Hall and Stewart today. Um, and we're hoping to provide a bit of a look back at where we came from uh, in 2018 and where we are today as it relates to both enforcement climate, as well as some of the newest updates from federal grant making agencies, as well as OSTP related to the implementation of NSPM 33. Um, we're also going to look forward at um, where we're headed as it relates to research security programs and talk a bit about the draft requirements, which were posted for public comment back in March, and talk um, a bit about how we've seen institutions respond to what is really the newest distinct area of uh, research compliance. And if you go to the next slide, we will introduce ourselves. My name is Greg Smith. I'm a manager in Huron's higher education practice. I've worked on our research administration and compliance team for the last five and a half years. And I've served on our institutional thought leadership team as it relates to um, research security uh, since these topics first started to emerge. Um, in fact, I was working on an engagement at MD Anderson in 2018 when the institution first started to manage its response to FBI and NIH inquiries um, that were related to what we referred then as uh, foreign influence matters, but we've been helping institutions ever since um, in this way by either proactively assessing and building compliance programs that are responsive to these research security topics or also to help institutions respond to inquiries from federal agencies and build out and manage responses um, to external and internal audits. Um, before I pass the mic to Jordan to introduce herself, I'll also just quickly again say that I'm very excited and humbled, honestly, to be joined by two um, legal experts in this area from Choate um, who are going to share their insights as they've guided clients in managing these matters over the past several years, too. Um, Jordan, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Greg. Hi, everyone. I'm Jordan Bestland, and I'm a senior associate with Huron. I've been with Huron for almost four years, and my background is primarily in pre and post store grant administration. Prior to joining the firm, I worked at the University of Florida managing grants and contracts. And since coming to Huron, I've worked with Greg on our internal research security thought leadership team and served on several engagements supporting our clients as they navigate these issues. I'm also super excited to be here with our colleagues, Christine and Mark, and I'll hand it off to Christine to introduce herself. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, my name is Christine Savage. I'm a partner here at Choate in Boston, uh, which has been a very active location um, over the last several years in the areas of research security and what we formerly called foreign influence. Um, I've been with the firm for almost 30 years, and I've been working with universities and academic medical centers on a wide variety of research compliance issues, most recently research security. Uh, really since the late 1990s. And I'm thrilled to be here with Huron and with my colleague, Mark, who's worked with me on a number of these matters. Hey everyone, I'm Mark McPherson. I'm a senior associate in Choate's Government Enforcement Group. 
And I've worked with Christine on a number of uh, research security related cases since 2018. Thanks, Mark. We thought it would be interesting to um, start today with a poll question. There are several hundred of you in attendance. Um, and so using the functionality that just popped up on Zoom, um, we were hoping that you would quickly answer which description best fits the state of your institution's research security program implementation. Um, there's option one, you haven't yet started to implement a program. Option two, um, you're really in the initial planning stages or perhaps you're performing a gap analysis or a readiness assessment. <clears throat> Option three, uh, you um, really have started to implement a research security program, but it's in its infancy. Option four, you're nearly finished standing up your program. And then there's option five, you've got a program in place and you're continuing to refine your approach. I see we've got 100% um, answered and some variation um, in the responses, some interesting responses here. Um, quite a few of you have programs that are established and you're continuing to sort of transform um, as well as a lot of you are sort of planning um, and beginning to implement those programs. So super interesting result. Clicking through the full function. So for many of you, this slide might be old hat. <laughs> um, I think it is helpful though to look back retrospectively um, as we begin to think about how to move forward. Um, anyone who keeps up with the news can attest that there is a lot of pushing and shoving going on around the world um, between our country's uh, sort of competition with China and the fierce debate over Taiwan, um, the war in Ukraine, ongoing conflicts in the Middle East. Uh, it's clear that our government is not only committed to a strong defense posture in order to defend American interests, but it's also clear that they're tying this posture to the security of our economy and uh, sort of this rules-based trade order. And it seems like protecting the US funded research base is a sort of key component of this strategy. And over the last five years, some of the initial updates related to the federal government's response to foreign influence were pretty controversial. Um, sometimes they were unclear or conflicting, um, especially the China initiative. Um, but I think what's come into focus is that the federal government's commitment to closing any real or perceived gaps related to securing our research enterprise is unwavering and has bipartisan support. Um, in 2019, starting at the top, that purple um, bucket there, um, what you saw are responses to DOJ's China initiative and the Trump administration's China initiative um, that cited that China was involved in the majority of all trade theft. And there were federal agencies and pockets that were attempting to kind of address these concerns on their own um, through dear colleague letters, through memos, through new public facing websites and disclosure matrices um, in the case of NIH. But then by January of 2021, the Trump White House, um, interestingly, in its last two weeks in office, issued um, an SPM 33. And it was a pretty chaotic time, if you recall. Um, and this was a directive to the US government to strengthen protections for intellectual capital and discourage research misappropriation. And then not long after Biden took office, um, his administration issued a blog post um, on OSTP's website that reaffirmed their commitment to the same NSPM 33 memo. And by January of 2022, um, they had released detailed implementation guidance um, for the Office of Management and Budget and for federal agencies. And it's essentially, this guidance was a set of recommendations and a roadmap for all federal sponsors for um, how to build a research security program federally. And then this past August, OSTP 
release an update on the status of that implementation. And we heard all year at professional conferences um, and some webinars that some of the federal agencies have begun to consider themselves almost finished with the implementation of NSPM 33. Um, NSF has led the charge in many ways related to this implementation. And in fact, um, representatives from NSF and NIH and other agencies um, continue to present together at conferences and in person um, to sort of affirm their commitment to finalizing what are really the key details. And we'll talk about those details today. Um, just a few weeks ago, draft research uh, security program requirements were released for public comment. Um, and this is really the kind of filed, final nail in the coffin for implementation, um, with the exception of some of the open source training programs that are still in development at several institutions around the country, funded by NSF and consort with some federal agencies, and also some of the details around DPI use and how the government will sort of leverage the, the data that comes from that to, to use data analytics post-implementation to foster implementation sharing. I'll also just say, um, sort of while the China initiative may very much be in the rear view mirror, um, we're still blazing down this research security highway and much of the regulatory framework has really begun not just to take shape, but um, only minor details are left. And um, now that we've kind of taken ourselves down memory lane and discussed these statutory parameters, um, I'm going to hand it over to Mark and Christine to also take us through an overview of some of the key enforcement cases and provide an update on where those stand. Go to the next slide. Yeah, so we'll talk briefly about the evolution of the China initiative in some specific cases. Um, from 2017 through 21, the DOJ was very busy with the China initiative, and uh, this slide just shows a few of those cases. Uh, really, the first of the highly publicized cases was that concerning MD Anderson personnel around 2017 through 18. Uh, that case reportedly involved five researchers, uh, one who allegedly violated peer review confidentiality by sharing a grant application. Uh, others reportedly had undisclosed appointments and affiliations in China or undisclosed conflicts of interest related to China. MD Anderson sought to terminate a number of those researchers and several of them resigned. Uh, next, we have the relatively rare instance, at least publicly, uh, in which the institution itself was the primary focus. Uh, in 2019, Van Andel Research Institute paid five and a half million dollars to settle False Claims Act allegations uh, about failure to disclose a researcher's Chinese funding in NIH grant documentation. And then in 2021, it paid another $1.1 million to resolve allegations that it failed to disclose a researcher's foreign component and research support. Uh, then we have the former chair of Harvard's chemistry and chemical biology department. Uh, he was arrested and charged in 2020, uh, found guilty in 2021 on two false statement accounts related to the NIH and DOD and four tax related counts. Uh, he was sentenced just last week, which we'll talk a little more about in a moment. Uh, next, uh, then Emory faculty member allegedly participated in the Thousand Talents program and failed to report income he earned to the IRS. Uh, it turns out that he'd earned $500,000 in unreported income from that participation and pleaded guilty to filing a false tax return and was sentenced to probation and to pay restitution. Uh, in August of 20, a WVU faculty member pleaded guilty to federal program fraud. Uh, there, the charges involved a fraudulent request for parental leave, uh, during which the researcher went to work at the Chinese Academy of Sciences as part of the Thousand Talents program. Uh, he was sentenced to three months in prison and had to pay restitution. Uh, finally, at MIT, we've got one high-profile example of a failed prosecution. Uh, the faculty member there was arrested and charged with wire fraud and tax-related counts. Uh, he was accused of failing to disclose his participation in Chinese talent programs and receipt of grants in China. And that case was dismissed at DOJ's request in January of 22. And then on the next slide, We'll see that uh, sort of on the heels of that dismissed case involving the MIT faculty member, uh, DOJ announced the supposed end of the China Initiative in February of 22. Uh, it was sunset in favor of a new strategy of countering nation state threats. 
uh, that would subsume the China initiative and add efforts related to countries like Russia, Iran, or North Korea. Uh, and as the slide says, it's probably reasonable to conclude that this was in part due to heavy criticism of the China initiative, um, on top of concerns that it reflected bias toward Chinese nationals or individuals of Chinese descent. Uh, it was criticized for being ineffective because of dismissed or failed prosecutions and a lack of cases involving actual espionage or IP theft. Uh, the, the final tally for the China initiative really was a mixed bag. Uh, MIT published a database of cases in late 21, and although that's now a little dated by this point, it still reflects sort of the overall outcomes for the China Initiative. Um, that database says that at the time there were 77 cases involving 150 defendants, uh, 23 were about research integrity, 19 involved the Economic Espionage Act, uh, other cases were about alleged hacking or corruption or failures to register as agents of foreign governments. Uh, at the time, there were eight guilty pleas, eight dismissals at the request of prosecution, and three individuals who were fully or partially acquitted. And uh, all, perhaps most notably, uh, no professors were indicted on charges of espionage or trade secret theft. And then on the next slide, talk about some updates in highly publicized cases, uh, which really do reflect these mixed results. Um, as I referenced a moment ago, uh, former Harvard professor Charles Lieber was found guilty on all charges in December of 21. Uh, he was found guilty of lying to Department of Defense investigators about his participation in the Thousand Talents program. Uh, and he was also found guilty of causing Harvard to make false statements to NIH about that participation. And there were guilty verdicts covering two false tax returns and two counts of failing to report a foreign bank account. Uh, professor Lieber retired from Harvard earlier this year. And he was sentenced uh, just on April 26th to time served, two years of supervised release, including six months of home confinement, about $34,000 in restitution to the IRS, and a $50,000 fine. And uh, according to the SAM database, uh, he remains suspended from conducting federally funded research. And also of note, uh, he sued Harvard in 2020, claiming right to indemnification for his legal defense costs, and that case remains ongoing. Uh, then also mentioned earlier, DOJ abandoned its case against Professor Gong Chen in January of 22, uh, and in its request for dismissal, DOJ cited its inability to meet the burden of proof. Uh, and this is noteworthy not just because DOJ dropped a high-profile case, but because the local U.S. Attorney's Office actually held a press conference there to announce that dismissal, uh, the idea perhaps being that if it had a big press conference to announce the arrest, it should do the same when requesting dismissal. Um, then we have the case against Professor Franklin Tao at KU, uh, which also sort of reflects this mixed bag that I referenced. Uh, he was accused of failing to disclose his participation in a Chinese talents program. Uh, he allegedly spent eight months in 2019 setting up a lab at Fuzhou University. Um, he argued that Fuzhou bought out his time at KU and that KU had agreed and prosecutors disagreed. Um, interestingly, at trial, DOE and NSF representatives actually testified that they were happy with his work. Um, and though the jury found him guilty on one false statement and three wire fraud counts, he moved for acquittal at the close of his trial, and this past September, he was largely successful. Uh, his acquittal was granted as to the wire fraud counts, and specifically, the judge said that no reasonable jury could have found that his conduct amounted to a scheme to deprive KU, DOE, NSF of any money or property. Uh, he was ultimately sentenced to time served for just the one false statement count. Next, uh, the case against Professor An Ming Hu resulted in another failed prosecution. Uh, he was alleged to have intentionally hit his ties to a Chinese university while working for NASA, uh, performing work for NASA. Uh, there, NASA regulations prohibited researchers from using NASA funds to participate or collaborate or coordinate uh, in any way with China or a Chinese-owned company. Uh, he was indicted in February of 20 on three counts each of wire fraud and making false statements, and a trial, uh, a mistrial was declared when the jury uh, couldn't reach a verdict after three days. Uh, the government later said that it wanted to retry Professor Hu, uh, at which time he asked the court to rule on the acquittal motion that he filed at the close of trial. And in September of 21, the judge granted the motion, which although very rare, uh, is the second case here uh, where that's happened. 
that court found that the university guidance suggested that the NASA restriction didn't apply to Professor Hu and that the government failed to show that he understood that it applied to him. Uh, and the court also said that NASA got the research that it bargained for. And finally, uh, at Ohio State, we have another institutional settlement. Uh, in November of 22, Ohio State resolved civil allegations that it failed to disclose a researcher's employment, grant funding, and talent program participation at a foreign university. Uh, there, Ohio State paid a little over $875,000 and agreed to cooperate with the government's investigation. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Christine to talk about kind of where that leaves us now with respect to enforcement. Thanks, Mark. Um, so now that Mark sort of walked you through what DOJ was up to uh, between 2018 and 2022, I want to talk a little bit about agency investigative and enforcement activity, um, which we're still seeing happen um, because, uh, you know, sort of for every uh, DOJ case you see, because those cases, you know, once they're formally charged um, are public, there are a lot of uh, additional cases that really get resolved at the agency level. Um, and so uh, there's been a lot more activity than some people may realize over the last few years. Um, you know, and as a compliance and white collar defense lawyer, um, while DOJ's role in these cases has diminished over time, um, you know, for good reason, um, there is some worry um, that despite the presence of NSPM 33 and the need to develop research security programs, that there are some institutions and researchers who are starting to revert somewhat to the viewpoint of, well, this is all just a paperwork issue and there won't be any consequences unless I'm doing something really at the extremes. And I, I don't think that's really reflective of where the agencies are and it, it's certainly not where they're heading. Um, and so I'll put my defense hat on for a, a moment or two and, and just offer a few observations, which may not be particularly groundbreaking, but uh, they're worth repeating um, and they may be worth repeating within your own organization. And um, one to echo something that Mark said is, you know, the PRC is not the only country of concern. Different agencies are focused on different countries. Uh, DOJ is still concerned about malign actors from other countries who may be using academic institutions to further their own aims, whether those are related to federally funded research or otherwise. Um, the CHIPS Act and other agency guidance have specifically focused on other countries of concern, including Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Um, and there are others that you know, we know have percolated up from time to time. Uh, but I think more importantly, the concern really isn't focused on countries at the agency level, it's focused on conflicts. So conflicts of interest, conflicts of commitment, which I think really uh, was something underappreciated um, by researchers in particular, um, and conflicts of obligation. And that ranges the gamut from intellectual property, um, you know, employment contracts, institutional loyalty, um, and the government's concerns in those areas really have not waned over time. Um, they're still completing their reviews of people that they started looking at in connection with the original China initiative. Um, the types of letters that you get uh, from those agencies don't materially differ from the ones that we were getting in 2018. Um, but I would say what has evolved is, at least in our experience, is the approach that the agencies are taking when they send one of those letters. Um, in some instances, the agencies are willing um, to share their internal work product with you upfront. You know, this is what we've been looking at. This is what we found. We want to see if this is reflective of what you have or what you were told internally and where there are discrepancies, sort of not hiding the ball and sort of cutting to the chase, you know, as quickly as possible. Uh, I think it's, it's also clear to those um, of us on the outside that the agencies really are focused on behavior um, rather than where that behavior took place or you know the, the number of zeros at the end of a dollar figure um, associated with it um, and a heightened sensitivity to the DE&I issues that may impact both the agency institution relationship as well as an institution's relationship with its own employees, um, students, et cetera. And so the, the behaviors that we see the agencies um, most focused on, you know, remain avoiding wrongful IP transfers and preserving U.S. rights. Um, you know, the FBI and the DOJ, when we have seen them involved, their focus seems to be on cases that involve, you know, has there been the surreptitious export or import of samples or compounds, uh, particularly if those may have applications as, uh, you know, a, a weapon of mass destruction or something that's biohazardous. Um, 
They're focused on distinguishing intent to deceive from a mere failure to disclose and not assuming that someone didn't disclose something for a nefarious reason. Um, and what we have found in some cases is that people at the agency were told. It's just not the people that are asking the questions now. Um, so someone may not have disclosed it on a current and pending support form, but they disclosed it in their discussions with a program director, or they disclosed it in emails with someone higher up the food chain about whether they should serve as a peer reviewer or whether they should serve on a particular committee um, with agency ties. And we've been able to resolve those situations um, fairly simply uh, and quickly. Um, the focus on conflicts of commitment, again, I think really is sort of um, taking more of a hold. Can someone complete their federally funded research given everything else that they have going on and making sure that all of those commitments are being accounted for in a way that is um, consistent and complete and, and causes the researcher to really think realistically can I get this done, uh, you know, or am I sort of shooting for the moon and I'll patch it together um, if everything comes through. Um, and then I would, I would remit to you, um, take a look at the NSF PAPPG for 2023. Um, they identify a number of specific factors that the agency is looking for in determining what types of consequences might be imposed on someone who doesn't disclose information. And those factors are really consistent with our experience in working with agencies. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the folks from here on for a bit. Thanks, Christine. Like I mentioned um, in our overview right at the top of the hour, um, the how we got here piece, um, OSTP released detailed implementation guidance related to NSPM 33 last January. It might be review for a lot of you, but um, I thought it helpful to just kind of talk quickly through the five major themes that was contained in the guidance and that um, to Christine's point, the agencies are trying to operationalize um, with some of their rules. Uh, the guidance established um, or instructed agencies to establish uh, disclosure requirements and make them uniform, including um, the guidelines and the content for such requirements. Um, for instance, they mandated that um, researchers disclose in-kind contributions or visiting scholars that weren't paid by their institutions. And they made it so that researchers had to attest and certify um, to each form um, in terms of the accuracy of the content of the forms. And the NIH has been doing it for some time now. Um, NSPM 33 also mandated the use of DPIs um, on forms and disclosures so that they could begin to tie together um, researcher affiliations and publications, um, sort of using this data-centered approach. Um, the January guidance also clarified what the consequences would be um, for institutions and for faculty, you know, from department suspension, criminal charges, um, to administrative or civil penalties. Um, Mark talked a little bit about some of the, some of the consequences. Um, the guidance also hinted that institutions that received above a certain dollar amount um, from the federal government would need to establish research security programs. We'll talk about the details of that later. Um, and like I mentioned previously, uh, to this end, NSF put out a call for proposals and made awards to a few institutions who were working um, with them actively to sort of uh, develop open source training programs, which are going to be available to institutions to leverage as a part of their research security programs. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, uh, last August um, in 2022, OSTP released a status update. Um, and the agencies talked not only about what the status was, but they also pulled the curtains back a little bit on the process and talked us through NSTC's subcommittee on research security um, and how they were doing outreach and sort of attempting to quantify the impact of the new requirements. Um, I think the biggest or the most exciting update for universities was that they linked out to the new draft um, uniform disclosure forms, which are being used today and piloted at NSF. And we're starting to see some other agencies do the same with some interesting twists, I will say. I mean, it's funny that they're called uniform forms because of the forms from DOE have DOE's own language in them, talking about certifying to the accuracy 
Um, and so it, it's a little bit ironic there, but I think that the, the devil is going to be in those details and they'll continue to sort of refine their approach to making these forms easier to use. Um, I will share that in a webinar as recently as last week, NSF and NIH again provided another update on their work together to implement NSPM 33. And they talked about how these draft uniform disclosure forms have been submitted. Um, they're off to the races. Public comment window has been closed. But I do think we can anticipate, and I think Mark and Christine will talk to this later, that we'll see additional definitions and FAQs from the agency to sort of refine the operationalization of these um, forms. You know, what is the intent? What are the expectations in terms of the content and how they'll use, um, how the agencies will use the content? Um, the agencies also sort of hammered home that um, you will, um, institutions and faculty will need to sort of adopt Science CV um, and ORCID um, as soon as October. Um, and so I think that we can continue to expect more details to, to, occur, to sort of emerge um, from the agencies, but I think we know um, what the, the ultimate structure will be. Um, I'll pass it quickly over to Jordan um, to just talk us through um, a bit about chips. Yeah, you see if you wanna to go to the next slide. So the Chips and Science Act was signed into law on August 9th, 2022. Um, while the act aims to boost R&D funding for translational semiconductor research, there are several provisions related to research security. This, in many ways, adds a layer to federal law that will need to be implemented by grant-making agencies. Um, so far, we've seen NSF has been impacted the most by the Chips and Science Act, and it remains to be seen the, tri the trickle-down effect to other federal agencies and how they'll harmonize the requirements within NSPM 33, the Chips and Science Act, and the research security provisions within the NDA. A couple of provisions within CHIPS related to NSF include the amending of the America Competes Act to modify the requirements for RCR training to include research security and export control topics, providing authorization to the NSF Office of Research Security and Policy to conduct risk assessments on R&D award applications, requiring institutions to annually on financial support greater than 50,000 that the institution receives directly or indirectly from a foreign source associated with a foreign country of concern like China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. Um, this includes gifts and contracts, um, failure to accurately report um, this connection um, could lead to termination or reduction of award for the institution. And finally, requiring institutions to certify that no individual participating in the research is part of malign foreign talent programs. We've yet to see the full impact of the Chips and Science Act, but have already seen more funding solicitations and investments in this space. Um, NSF has a full website dedicated to um, the Chips and Science Act and um, funding opportunities. I know Greg mentioned in the previous slide, NSF's pilot of the standardized disclosures, and I'm gonna turn it over to Christine and Mark to talk about the recent changes in the PAPPG. Thanks, Jordan. Um, so I think Greg's already addressed a little bit of this, just in terms of some of the new, um, new-ish uh, sort of clarifications on things that need to be disclosed and you know just as importantly as what needs to be disclosed where it needs to be disclosed um, you know in terms of visiting scholars and in-kind support something that you know I think if we went back two or three years uh, most places were not um, reporting or they were uncertain as to you know whether there were certain thresholds that needed to be met um, before that was being reported and so now we've got a little bit more clarity on that front um, which I think is helpful um, it's also helpful 
for people to be thinking not only about those types of in-kind support, but also startup packages, relationships with startup companies that may not be directly related to a proposed project, um, but relate generally to the person's uh, you know, sort of area of study um, and venture capital being added as a disclosure type as well. Because I think that's an area that uh, people considered previously to be something that was totally outside um, of their academic relationship and, and oftentimes um, was not reported. Uh, in terms of the, the PAPPG changes, uh, I think you know, some of those requirements um, uh, you know, are still being implemented. Um, and so people will be using Science CV for the bi uh, biographical sketch and CPS. Those need to be um, done in that particular mode, I think as of October, um, and NSF is encouraging people to start using it now. Um, you know, other things that people will need to be prepared for is that program officers will be requesting an updated CPS prior to making a funding recommendation. Um, and so for those researchers who are less familiar with sort of the just in time types of submissions um, on the NIH side of the house, sort of, you know, being prepared to update your CPS um, more frequently uh, and quickly uh, in order that funding determinations can be finalized will be important. Um, and then updating and being prepared again to update that information throughout the project with the expectation being that it will be at least annually, uh, that there may be certain types of things that uh, the government will wanna know about uh, right away. Uh, and then again, potentially at the end of a project. Um, and so that will be important to keep in mind. Um, also uh, the feature that an authorized organizational representative has to notify the agency within 30 days if you identify something that was undisclosed. And I think that's something that um, you know, will need to be sort of um, refined over time, uh, particularly with FAQs and instructions to institutions and researchers. Um, you know, there's always that tension between making reports of things that weren't disclosed on time, sort of ubiquitous and every, you know, everyone's reporting everything um, so that the agency can't appropriately filter it. Um, you know, there's, there's also the concern that um, institutions, I think, um, fear that they will be judged if they are reporting too often, that they don't have controls. Um, whereas, you know, wearing my compliance hat for a moment, I want people to tell me, oops, I forgot to report something, and then I want to report it right away. And I don't want to be dinged for that. I want to be given credit that we've created a culture within the organization that people are coming forward and telling us, and then we're timely communicating that information. And so um, I think it's good to see it in the PAPPG. I think we're all just going to have to wait and see sort of how, um, how it actually gets implemented and what the dynamic is between the agency and institutions as that rolls forward. Um, and then when I think about sort of implementation, you know, on the NSF side, um, just really um, keeping in mind that this is an evolving process. You know, there are gonna to continue to be more updates and, um, we should not expect that every other agency is going to adopt the exact language or approach that NSF will. And while um, you know there is a goal for uniformity, um, that's going to take, I think, a, a lot longer to get to. Um, and so I think um, patience and dialogue with the agencies um, to say, "Hey, I see a difference here. Is there a place where we can meet in the middle?" is is going to be necessary. Thanks, Christine. I, I think we can go to the next slide. Yes. Okay. So with all of the background on how we got to this, this point, it's super exciting. And I say this, like, hopefully mostly exciting for all of you as research and compliance administrators to finally see, like, what will be contained within the research security requirement. What we've heard from a few federal agencies is that they were mostly done a year ago with implementing elements from the original NSPM 33 memo. They had made updates to other support and biosketch documents, published matrices about disclosure requirements, and had put DPI use on the roadmap for implementation in the future. This was everything they needed to do to comply with the original memo with the exception of defining the requirements for 
research security programs and the research security training. So it's super exciting to see how these next steps will be implemented over the next couple of months and year. The four major pieces that were clarified in OSTP's March release were the confirmation that institutions receiving over $50 million in federal science and engineering support in the last two consecutive fiscal years will be required to have a research security program, expanding the requirement for international travel approval to include activities outside of sponsored research, the alignment of security, cybersecurity requirements to NIST, and expanding research security and export control training to include topics such as why research security is important, what is fundamental research, um, best practices for international travel, and protecting IP and data. So over the next few slides, Christine and Mark are going to tell us about um, what this perspective timeline looks like and dig into some more um, unanswered questions that we haven't seen so far. Thanks, Jordan. Um, so Jordan, talk to you a little bit about the, the what and the key pieces. I'm gonna focus for a minute on the when, um, because for those of you in research compliance and training and operations, the when often drives the what and the how, and just having sort of a basic timeline or framework in mind as you build and refine and publicize your program is, is going to be important, um, particularly for those of you who um, are sort of, uh, you know, at the, the first couple of options in that polling question that we did at the, the top of the hour. Um, you know, if your program is more nascent, there's, there's gonna be more things that you need to do. Um, so the notice and comment period, which I'll talk a little bit about um, in a moment, um, that runs through June the 5th. Um, we expect that COGER and AAU, AAMC and others um, will be submitting comments. Um, they have already suggested to OSTP via publicly available letter that um, OSTP conduct listening sessions um, as they have in the past in order to get additional feedback, um, in part because there is a five page limit on um, comments um, from any one um, submitter. Um, so the more options that are available for people to communicate their um, questions or concerns, um, the better. And, and we hope that those listening sessions will occur. Um, once that notice and comment deadline gets hit, um, and assuming it doesn't get extended, um, the agencies are provided about 120 days to review the comments and then finalize um, the program requirements. Um, if that were to occur on time, and I'm by no means suggesting that it will, but just sort of in terms of a rough timeline, that would put us at October 3rd of this year. Um, and then institutions who meet that $50 million threshold as needing to have a program in place would then have 120 days or until the end of January of 2024 to provide a publicly available status update on their research security program. And that can be done via your website or other publication, but something to sort of let the government and let the public know sort of where you are and, and when you think you'll be ready. Um, and then the certification of compliance would need to be ready one year from the issuance of the actual sort of final memo. Um, so if that were to happen on October 3rd, and it cannot imagine a situation where it happens before that, um, October 3rd of 2024 would be when you know certifications from institutions uh, and researchers would be necessary related to the research security program. Um, and so, you know, for me, the, the questions um, that I'm thinking about um, and, you know, working with clients to think about when thinking about the timeline is sort of, you know, what do I need to build in? Um, you know, I need a way to answer questions that I get from senior and key personnel. I need to be able to update materials quickly and routinely. Um, I'm going to need systems flag so that if someone reports something late, uh, that there's a streamlined process and person or personnel to whom that information goes um, so that we can routinize the disclosure process. Um, and, and frankly, we need some comfort that benign or late disclosures um, aren't going to get penalized or create sort of a, a culture or an attitude of distrust with agencies. Um, and then once I build it, I've got to publicize it. So I have to have central points of contact. That's one of the requirements of the program. Um, and it's got to be easy to use. And so you need to build in time for once you've built it, 
it needs to look and feel accessible and understandable. Um, and that's going to require IT. It may require outside consultants. It's going to require faculty and researcher feedback. Um, you know, are all the definitions in a place where if I'm filling out a form, I can quickly find them and know that I'm giving the answer to the best of my ability? Or are you going to send me to 20 different places to look for that information? So how do we make it easy for the community that, that needs to use it? So once you've built it, and you've publicized it, you've got to train people on it. Um, and while there are training modules that are being built out, they're not available yet. Um, I think the hope is that they will be ready sometime in the fall, um, but we need to assume that that timeline might slip somewhat. Um, and so, it, you know, if it gets to spring and we haven't been able to roll out all of those pieces, how many of my researchers are away for the summer, have nine month appointments? Am I going to be able to get them to do the training, you know, in that first six weeks of the fall semester when they come back. What do I do with new people? I've got new postdocs coming in who may have been a TBD um, as key personnel and they're stepping into that role right away and, and how do I get them trained? Um, and then who's gonna help me assess how the program is working? Um, is that something that's gonna get done internally by risk management or internal audit? Is it gonna be done externally? and and how frequently. And so um, that's really why I wanted to sort of walk through the timeline so that you can start thinking about, you know, regardless of where you are in, in developing your own program, sort of how much time do I have um, and how does that impact how I build it and who do I need to have involved in, in building it as I go. Um, and then it, quickly we'll move to the next slide. And this is really just a, a framework for thinking about things. Um, sort of the text on the slides um, or the bullets is, is less important, but I just, I really wanna address in a little bit more detail the continued opportunity to submit comments um, to OSTP regarding the draft program memo. Um, they've specifically asked for comments focusing on clarity, equity, feasibility and burden, uh, among other things. Um, again, we know that many of the major associations will be submitting comments, um, but again, given that five page limit, the more people who are submitting comments and questions, uh, I think the better. Um, and then we hope that the, the listening sessions, if they occur, um, will help broaden the range of issues that are sort of brought to the forefront. Um, so in terms of you know, the, the first sort of box, how much flexibility is there? Um, you know, taking an, an inventory for yourself, how much of the research that your institution does is fundamental versus applied? Um, how much of it is classified, if any, uh, or does it involve um, controlled, unclassified information? Are, you know, are there areas that you need to focus on more in building out your program sort of as a practical matter? How many agencies are you getting funding from? If you're not doing anything defense related, does that sort of shift how you're going to approach cybersecurity because you're not gonna to need to comply with CMMC or do you wanna sort of view CMMC in conjunction with um, everything else you're thinking about from a cybersecurity perspective? And um, so focusing on um, or figuring out in the comment period, how much flexibility really is there um, and how will that impact sort of how you build and refine your program. Um, definitionally, um, I think if you go around a table of three to five people um, charged with operating your program, you know, whether it's OVPR, compliance, legal, OSP, if you can't quickly agree on what a term is in the, the nine page you know, draft research security program, um, there's gonna be inconsistent application of the rules internally, let alone in dealing with an agency. And so I think if, if within your own group, you can't quickly agree as to what is being asked for, that's ripe for a, a comment um, to get that clarity. Um, you know, Coger submitted a letter um, last year in connection with a number of the definitions that were proposed um, and are now you know, being implemented um, with the biographical sketch and the CPS forms. Um, and I still don't feel like there are great definitions for a number of those things. Um, you know, what's the difference between a professional appointment and an institutional appointment? Which ones do I need to provide historically versus only the current ones? Um, because if I think about it philosophically in terms of what does the agency care about, like, I'm not sure if I understand now if what they're asking for is really what's gonna get them to what they need to properly enforce. Um, and so, it, and that's not, it's not defined. 
So um, institutional appointment isn't distinguished from a professional appointment, um, you know, versus, you know, something else. So, uh, you know, taking a look at those definitions and making sure you're comfortable with what they mean at your institution um, and where there's disparity sort of asking. Um, feasibility and burden questions, um, particularly with regard to cybersecurity. Um, you know, there's, I think, always a tension between keeping data, you know, locked up tight and secure and the, you know, academic principle of open academic research and being able to share information. And a lot of the criteria that are set forth as um, needing to exist within a cybersecurity program are things that make it harder to share that information. And so figuring out really sort of what are the academic needs of the institution and building your cybersecurity infrastructure um, in a way that allows you to continue to satisfy those. I think it, it's still unclear whether um, some of the NIST um, standards are true requirements or is it best practice? Um, and so additional clarity on like, what do I absolutely need to have as a floor? And then, you know, what would make it, you know, better best, um, you know, in terms of practice, I, I think it's going to be important from a feasibility and burden standpoint. Um, and then in terms of the provision of research security documents to agencies. So NSF has said, and OSTP says, the agencies have the right to ask you for sort of a packet of information and that you need to provide that within a short period of time, but we have no idea what's in the packet. So having some guidance as to like, what is the standard packet? If, if much of the standard packet is something that could be on my research support security program website, can I just put it there and send you a link and then send you any additional information in a particular way so that we're not using costly, vital compliance resources to respond to sort of routine requests for information, but really doing the work of assessing and, and building a program. Um, and then training, you know, really thinking about beyond what has to be in the training program, you know, to satisfy the federal requirements. What about your own institutional policies also needs to be included in that training? Um, and you know, how are you going to incorporate those two things? Um, I know we're running short on time, and I really want to get to the second polling question and some of the program structure issues. So I'm going to turn it back over to Greg and Jordan. No, thanks, Christine. I think this is a great uh, discussion. Um, we can go to the next slide, and um, we'll quickly kind of walk through this polling question, which is, who is primarily responsible for research security at your institution? I will note that it's kind of a trick question, um, but you know, research integrity and compliance might be responsible. Research administration might be responsible. There might be a distinct unit within research that's new and responsible, or it might be a conscious choice to put that unit outside of research and under a general counsel or an institutional compliance function, or you might be still kind of figuring that out, which I think is fair and square. But to Christine's point, we are running short on time to figure that, these things out, and we need to start asking some questions now. Uh, I think we have varying results, but interesting results. Almost we're at 100% answered. I will share the results now on the screen. Um, most folks seem like they're sitting this under research integrity and compliance, but I'll I'll say that there's some some pretty varied results. 16% uh, in research administration, 9% have their own distinct unit within research, and 5% are showing that there's another separate unit outside of research. Um, we'll go to the next slide, Casey. So just quickly, and I think to this exact point about it being a trick question, a trick poll question, Huron did a preliminary analysis of 16 R1 universities a few months ago. And we found um, that most, but only by a little bit, distinct research security units reported up through research integrity and compliance functions within divisions of research, which is uh, aligns with the poll results that we just got. But we also found that um, almost half of the 16 had quite a bit of variation um, for how they were structured. Um, and they were either 
maybe beginning to structure some programs. There were some instances of that too, but sometimes research security might make sense to be, again, positioned purposefully outside of research um, under an institutional compliance or general counsel function. Um, and there are certainly instances where um, it reports up through research administration or research integrity, or it's its own separate um, function under research. I think oftentimes when you work with consultants, you might get a it depends answer. And I think it, it's fair because um, it really does depend on how your organization is set up and what the risk tolerance is and um, who the stakeholders are, et cetera. But I think that as um, all institutions kind of get going with their research security programs, if we do another benchmarking exercise um, a bit wider, um, you know, later this year, we'll get some maybe even better or more interesting results. And we'll certainly share the results that we just got on our polling question back with all who attended today. Um, but just to close us out, if we move to the next slide, um, I think, this is a little bit of how Huron has thought about um, approaching assessing and building um, research security programs. I remember I was staffed on our first engagement um, related to building a program with an institution who was interested in shaping their compliance program to respond to foreign influence inquiries before NSPM 33 was really even a thing. And on our first call, the client executive sponsor, she was the director of sponsored programs said, really one of her main impetuses for um, starting this project was to prove to stakeholders across her institution that research security wasn't just a research problem. And I think, um, boy, was she right. Uh, if you look at the requirements in the research security programs that um, Jordan talked about, that Christine just delved into, um, the point is um, that they involve stakeholders from across the institution. And so I think um, what we've depicted here is a house that's built for research security. On top, you see these oversight bands um, that allow uh, leaders to effectively manage risk and, and monitor risk, ask those questions that Christine talked about that you should be submitting <laughs> um, right now as the requirements are open for public comment. Um, to continue to refine and enhance programs, as many of you have indicated that you're doing when, for those of you that have already established research security programs, and really put a bow on top of all of the activities, some of which are research administration and compliance activities that take place at your institutions, but others um, that are sitting out and functional units that don't frequently engage with research administration and research compliance like advancement and development, like human resources, um, like the CISOs that are going to need to weigh in on um, the breadth and depth of those NIST requirements, um, the procurement office, and certainly travel offices um, at institutions are going to be, um, I think, taken a bit aback by some of the new requirements and research security programs. But I think um, our point of view at Huron and what we've experienced is just there's no way to tackle this um, just working with um, stakeholders in research administration or research integrity and compliance or, or researchers, you really need to take a step back and take a sort of integrated institutional approach to building these programs. I want to be sensitive to the fact that we are at the top of the hour. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, we um, have been collecting quite a few questions in the Q&A. We'll circle back um, with more information on how we'd like to address those, perhaps in a follow-up session with Christine and Mark. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending today. I want to especially thank Christine and Mark for sharing their insights and their analysis. Um, Thanks, everybody, for joining. Have a good rest of your day. Sign off. <laughs> Probably. Yep, feel free to log off. <laughs> You're good. Right, thanks. Thank you guys. Have a good one.